Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Fugar and welcome to another Academic Xenos live session on physics. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Ohm's law, uh, charges, currents, and voltages, a lot of uh, electricity and electrical circuit stuff. And you know, uh, as usual, we have a uh, published author, Kalim Akbar, here with us. Um, and uh, just a heads up, this is uh, what we're discussing today is applicable for GCSE and IGCSE students uh, across all uh, board. And all the resources are in the description below. And without further ado, uh, let's get started. Hey, Philippe. Hi there, Buck. Thank you very much for the introduction again. Xenos, we are doing quite a major topic for students today. Um, you know, a lot of students struggle with electricity. They struggle with concepts of voltage and resistance. The vast majority seem to handle um, current okay, but the other ones seem to be, you know, ones that uh, cause a lot of confusion. So before we even get into Ohm's law today, it's really imperative for us to understand how simple circuits work, to understand current voltage and resistance before we can even tackle Ohm's law. But once we do get there, I'll be tackling Ohm's law. I'll be showing you why that's an important experiment, especially for practical, multiple choice and paper four, and how it's the basis of a lot of what we're going to be doing today and on Thursday. So let's unpack it. So first of all, why does a circuit light up? For example, why, when you have a bulb in a circuit, why will it light up? Why do some circuits work? And why, if we try to do something else, would it not work? Well, this is all to do with conductors and insulators. First of all, for a complete... yes. apologies to interrupt, but um, your slide doesn't seem to be changing for some reason. Uh, well, it is on my side. <laughs> yeah, um, can you just maybe uh, screen share once again, because it doesn't uh, change you. Uh, okay, give me a second. It uh, works now. Uh, no problem, give me a second. Right, well, I do not know what's happened there. We seem to have lost. Pugs, I seem to have lost you. Hey, can you hear me? Seem to have lost you, buddy. Um, Hello? Claim, uh, can you hear me? I can, but I seem to have okay. lost. We're back. Um, nope, seem to have lost everything. It's it's not going forward. Like the presentation is not working. Is that the issue? Okay, so I guess we've run into a small technical glitch. Uh, we'll get back to it in a second or two. Pugs, I seem to have lost my screen. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't know whether... Right, I don't know whether it'd be better just to restart because I... All I've got is a blue screen. No idea what's going on. Whoops. All right. Uh, blue screen. Uh oh. Well, yeah, sure. Um, take your time. Um, okay, I guess we'll resume the session in about a minute or two uh, because we just ran into a small technical situation. 
طيب Um, okay, so a question's come in. Uh, how do you put um, Ohm's law as a definition in words if this was a uh, two marks? Um, well, you know, Ohm's law. All right, so Ohm's law is nothing but V is equal to IR, right? Um, so you could just say, uh, you know, the voltage passing through a given resistor is proportional to current flowing through it. In a sense, in a very loose sense. They could. So yes. And if you guys have got more questions, you can keep putting it up in the chat box. Okay, uh, so we're back. <laughs> All sorry, right. sorry about that, guys. My apologies. Right, no let's get stuck into this and unpack this. Why is it that certain circuits work and others don't? Well, quite simply, if a circuit will conduct, then it will work. And if it's complete, it will work. So let's very, very quickly look at the simple difference between a conductor and an insulator. So here, I have a rather simple circuit. I've got a battery and I've got a bulb and I've deliberately created a gap. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this screwdriver and I'm going to use the, the wooden or plastic, if you like, end of the screwdriver and put it between the circuit to try to complete the circuit. 
Well, the thing is, plastic's an insulator. So what happens? Surprise, surprise, the bulb doesn't light. Now, when I go over to the metal side and connect it between the two wires, I now have a complete circuit. Okay, so now the light bulb lights. So the steel part, conductor. Why? Because it has free mobile electrons. When I had it in the plastic end, it wouldn't conduct. Why? Because it doesn't have free mobile electrons. A plastic is an insulator. So they don't have free electrons, therefore it will not conduct. Now to give you an analogy, now I personally think this can cause misconceptions as well as you know help you understand. You know, here it looks like the wire has very few charges going around the circuit. In truth, it's charge after charge after charge after charge. Think about it like a roller coaster, but a roller coaster that has no gaps. From start to finish, there is a little carriage that you could sit in. So whilst it looks like there are gaps here, there really shouldn't be. Not sure why the arrows are shooting off to the side, but hey, basically, here's another example of water acting in the same way. Now, some countries don't have you know, central heating in the same way that other countries do. For example, a central boiler that pumps water all the way around your house. So how this will work is water will be hit up in the boiler and that boiler will then, once the water is hot, it will be pumped around your house to a radiator. So what can you think of with regards to the water? Well, you can think of the water as flowing charge. How can you think about the heat? Well, that's the energy given to the charge. That is what we're going to call voltage. Okay, so what then happens? These charges move around the circuit to the heater. And what does the heater do? The heater gives out heat. Okay, so how does this system work? How does it compare to a battery in a bulb? Well, the battery is giving the charges energy. Those charges then move around the circuit and then those charges then give the energy to the bulb and that bulb then lights up. You're going to come across terms like EMF, electromotive force, where the energy comes from. And you're going to hear about terms like potential difference, areas where the energy is being used, such as a bulb. So to make this very, very clear, the battery and the boiler are acting very, very similarly in that they are giving energy to something, the boiler to the water, the battery to the charges. These charges, known as current, when they flow, okay, not the charges themselves, but when they flow around the circuit, that's called current. They carry that energy to a device that's going to use it. So in this case, on the left-hand side, the heater, and on the right-hand side, a bulb. So just to summarize, the water was like the electrons, it carries the charge. The pipes are like the wires, they carry the electrons. And the boiler and the pump are like the battery, it gives the electrons energy. Okay, the radiator is like the bulb, it takes the energy from the electrons and uses it. So for example, a radiator radiates heat and a bulb will radiate both light and heat, even though we don't really want the heat. Right. Guys, in a wire, it's the electrons that carry the charge. The unit of charge is the coulomb. And one electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Now, you might think, what's the big deal there? Guys, the first formula you will come across is Q equals IT. All right. And whenever we define current, we tend to do it in terms of coulombs of charge. So, for example... You're going to learn Q equals IT, I equals Q divided by T. A current of three amps means that three coulombs of charge pass by a point in a second. And I hope to be able to illustrate that to you with a drawing shortly. If it was a current of 10 amps, it would be 10 coulombs per second. Well, those are very, very big numbers in comparison to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So why do we do it this way? Well, if you do chemistry and you come across Avogadro's number or Avogadro's constant, you'll know that it's roughly 6.02 times 10 to the 23, if I'm slightly out, whatever. 
You can correct me, pick me up on it. But that's equal to one mole, right? So what do we do? We try to make numbers easier to deal with in physics, as we do any science. One Coulomb is basically billions and billions and billions of electrons. You know, if we look at pugs here, do you ever, you know, you're watching pugs, do you think of pugs as billions and billions of protons, neutrons, electrons? No, that's pugs. Okay, pugs the whole. But the reality is, pugs is made up of billions and billions of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So what I want you to understand is forget the protons and neutrons. Think of pugs as billions of electrons, but we're not going to call them that. We're going to call them one coulomb of charge. Okay, we're going to embody him as one coulomb. In other words, what I'd like you to understand is, imagine a train carriage going around a circuit. The carriage is a coulomb. Inside the carriage, there's lots and lots of electrons. Now, why am I explaining it this way? See, it's okay to say current is the flow of charge. It's okay to say current is the flow of electrons. But I would say to you, say current is the flow of charge or the rate of flow of charge. Why? Because when it comes to voltage, the definition takes on extra significance. Okay, and we'll get there very shortly. So current is the rate of flow of charge. You could say rate of flow of electrons, but I urge you it's better not to. Shortly you'll find out why. I equals Q divided by T. The unit is Coulomb per second, better known as the ampere, named after Andre Ampere. So for example, like I said, a current of three amps means three coulombs of charge pass by a point in one second. How do we measure current? We measure it using an ammeter. Right, something to point out at this time. Conventional current and electron movement. You will see book after book after book talk about conventional current. And they'll talk about it going from positive to negative. When in actual fact, electrons go from negative to positive. So what's going on here? A very, very long time ago, scientists used to think that electrons were positive and they went from positive to negative. When they found out it was the other way around, they then labelled it conventional current. Now you might go, well, why did they stick to this lie? Who cares? When's the last time you played your PlayStation and thought, I wonder which way current is going today? As long as the circuit is complete, it works. Whether it goes from positive to negative or negative to positive, as long as it's a complete circuit, the bulb will work. So electron movement is from negative to positive. Conventional current is from positive to negative. And another reason why we get away with it is if you think about chemistry and do electrolysis, positive ions can go towards the negative and negative ions can go towards the positive to give you current. So negative to positive. Okay. So guys, here's where, you know, I said to you current is the flow of charge or rate of flow of charge if I'm being geeky. Or you could say current is the rate of flow of electrons. Why do I ask you to stay away from current as the rate of flow of electrons? Because of the definition I'm about to give you right now. EMF, electromotive force, another name for voltage. Okay? This is the energy gained by charges when they go through a battery. Notice it says charges, coulombs of charge, not each individual electron. Let's take pugs again. Let's say Pugs has a pizza. Um, it's the end of the week. He wants a pizza, right? Whatever. We don't think of each individual cell in his body taking the nutrients that he needs. But that's exactly what happens. We look at it as Pugs as a whole taking everything that he needs. And guys, the same is true for EMF, all right? It's the energy given by each coulomb of charge. The definition is never the energy given by the energy gained by each electron. It would be wrong. So for consistency, and only for consistency, I urge you call current or define it as the rate of flow of charge, I equals Q over T, and define voltage as the energy given to each coulomb of charge. So EMF equals E over Q. So in the unit is joule per coulomb. 
but it was named after Alessandro Volta, and he basically said 1.5 joules per coulomb is 1.5 volts. So what the hell is going on here? Let me see if the next slide helps. Oh yeah, sorry, well to remember. Ammeters are always connected in series. Voltmeters are always connected in parallel. What does that mean? A voltmeter always goes across a component and an ammeter is always in line with a component. More on that later. Right, I don't think this is going to be handy. Let's do it here. Right, let's come back to this. Give me one second, guys. It should be opening now. Yep, it is. Sorry, just trying to find. There we go. Okay, so an ammeter would always be connected in series. That's series. A voltmeter would always be connected in parallel. So, what is current? Current is those big red dots moving around the circuit. But what I want you to understand is they don't have spaces between them. It's like a train. It's one after the other after the other. But these red dots can carry energy. Okay, obviously I can't move the energy with the red dot. But that energy is given to each coulomb of charge. That's what we call voltage. Now, I need to make this clear. Voltage is not the red energy squiggle that I've drawn. And it's not the red dot moving around the circuit. Voltage is both of them combined. It's the energy given to each coulomb of charge. In other words, if this was a 10 volt battery, each one of those red dots gets 10 joules. If it was a 10 volt, a 20 volt battery, each one of those red dots gets 20 joules. The voltage is the red dot with that red fluffy stuff that I've put around the outside together as a combination. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So next, what's potential difference? It's the energy lost by the charges when they go through a bulb, etc. Now, it's not really lost. We know where it's going. It's going to the bulb, or it's going to your PlayStation, or it's going to your mobile phone, or it's going to a light switch, or it's, you know, it can go to many, many different, your television, etc. That is what uses the energy. So think about it. The battery gives it, or a power station gives it, and your devices use that energy. So basically the electrons are a means of transportation, just like the water was. So the boiler made the water hot. The water, when it flowed, that was your current. The heat is what it was carrying. So that's the energy. And then it gave it to the radiator. Well, in our world, it gives it to my microphone, my iPad, the television, the, the lights, the, 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 the other lights I've got down here, my my digital to analog converter is giving all of these things energy. So it's still the same formula, energy divided by charge. The unit is still joule per coulomb and named after Alessandro Volta, it's measured in volts. To connect, uh, to measure the potential difference, we always connect a voltmeter in parallel. Okay. Now, what does our resistor do in a circuit? Well, basically, here we've got a circuit with no resistor. Okay, bulb is very, very bright. And here we've got a circuit with a resistor, and now the bulb is dim. Now, why is that happening? Actually, too often students mess this up in an exam. Students will say, ah, it's because the voltage is being shared. You know, let's say it was a six volt battery and the resistor and the bulb had equal resistance. They would say, ah, it's three volts and three volts. Part of the reason, 
only part of the reason. And others soon go, ah, it's because of the current. Higher the resistance, the smaller the current. Part of the reason too. The real reason why the bulb is dimmer is not just because of current, is not just because of voltage, it's because of both of them. It's because of something called power. P equals I V. Power equals current times voltage. Okay, so what's going on? Let's move on. So resistance is voltage divided by current. So guys, why would you have a resistor? It's a bit like friction. Is friction always a bad thing? No. If you want to slow down a car, friction's a good thing. If you want to stop too much current or voltage going through, too much current going through or too much voltage going across a bulb, because maybe, you know, you've got a really big battery and it's got to feed many, many components, then you may want to put a, a resistor in series just to reduce uh, the amount of current going in it and the voltage going across. Okay, resistors are helpful. Sometimes, you know, think about a tap. Why is it that you may only run a tap a little? Because you don't want the water blasting out. Well, that's resistance. If you lowered the resistance of the tap, as an analogy, water would come flying out the tap. So again, it's all about control. Maybe you've got a dimmer switch at home where you want to make your bulb brighter or dimmer. That's a variable resistor that you're using. A resistor opposes the flow of charge. In other words, it acts against it. It's like electrical friction. Too much resistance, not a lot of current, and actually subsequently not a lot of voltage across the light bulb. Little resistance, you get more current in the circuit and you get more voltage across the light bulb, the bulb becomes brighter. So the formula is R equals V over I, okay, which is voltage over amps. And the unit for that was named after Ohm. Okay, this is known as Ohm's law. George Ohm called it the Ohm way, way, way back. Can't remember the year. Now, the formula is called Ohm's law, right? This is not the Ohm's law experiment. It's just the formula itself. So, guys, now I am going to describe to you Ohm's Law and how you would do it in school. So, guys, you've got a battery at the top or a cell. Down the bottom, you've got your resistor. You've got a voltmeter across the fixed resistor and an ammeter in series. On the right-hand side, you've got a variable resistor. Now, what do you do here? Well, a lot of students, you know, they think just take one measurement, do V over I, and you get the resistance. That's not how experiments work. You need multiple measurements to ensure that your experiment is accurate. So what you'll do is you'll adjust the variable resistor. What happens there? Well, when you're doing that, you're adjusting the voltage and the current. Do that five times. Do that ten times. What will happen? You will get five or ten different readings. Why do you want to do that? So you can draw a table. Why do you want to do that? So you can draw a graph. Why do you want to do that? So you can see the relationship between voltage and current, and then ultimately see what the resistance is of this unknown fixed resistor. So to give you an idea, if you were doing this in class with me, I would have a resistor that I would know the resistance of. You wouldn't. I'd give it to you. You'd all do the experiment, and very quickly I can check if you are right or not. So for example, if I had a 10 ohm resistor, I expect your results to give me 10 ohms. If I had a 20 ohm one, I expect your results to give me 20. Now, what do I mean by results? So the ammeter goes in series, as I've already said. Okay, they have almost no resistance. They don't reduce the current. Voltmeters go in parallel. They have a huge resistance, so they don't take any current from the circuit. And what you're now going to do is draw a table with your results, and voila, you get a straight line through the origin. Now, how do we find resistance? We do V divided by I. Now, whilst it's not correct that you need the gradient, the gradient is a useful technique in making your answers more accurate. So what you should do here is find the rise over run, do the change in Y over the change in X, okay? And that will give you the resistance. Now, if you've done it properly, you'll get 10 ohms if I give you 10 ohms. 
you'll get 50 ohms if I give you 50 ohms. Word the warning for the practical paper. Why use a battery, not a power pack? Keep the power low. Why? So it doesn't heat up so much. Why switch it on and off between readings? Keep the heating effect low. Why? Because you're going to learn that heating affects the resistance. So if you heat something up too much, the resistance will increase. And therefore, it will not obey Ohm's law. So guys, these are all very, very handy tips for the exam itself. You want to keep the current low. Think about your mobile phone. It's been charging all night. You pick it up in the morning. How does it feel? Pugs, how does it feel? It's hot as the sun. I don't want to touch it. <laughs> right? This is a whole point. Yeah. That will affect your results, guys. The resistance has increased. Okay? So, um, when you're doing this experiment, to make Ohm's Law work, using a low power is helpful. Switching on and, switching on and off the circuit between readings in other words, using a switch, which I've not used here, is helpful. Drawing a table of results so you can draw your straight line through the origin is helpful. And the gradient, whilst not strictly needed, is very helpful in giving you an accurate result for resistance. And like I said, if I know it's 100, then your R equals V over I should give you 100 or 10 or 50, whatever it is that I gave you. Okay? So... I mean, that is Ohm's Law explained. It was done pretty quickly. But for me, the key here is you've really got to understand that current is the rate of flow of charge. The voltage is the energy given to each coulomb of charge and resistance is the opposition to charge, like electrical friction. So the electrons, when they flow, that's current. The energy they carry, they carry combined makes voltage. Not the energy, not the charge, combined. Like... You know, speed is measured in meters per second, right? Speed is not distance. Speed is not time. Speed is at both combined. Same here with voltage. It's the energy given to each coulomb of charge. And resistance is the opposition to the flow of charge. It's like electrical friction. And like friction, it can be useful. Okay? Could also be a hindrance, but it could also be useful. So, Pugs, unless you've got any questions for me, yeah, so we've just got three questions to field. Uh, and with that, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, so question, the first, like, all three are from Parth. Uh, so uh, will the resistance created decrease if I use a liquid conductor as a circuit such as mercury rather than copper wires? Now, Parth, I would have to check that off the top of my head, but I'm pretty pretty confident that copper is a better conductor than mercury, but I'd have to check that. Can a liquid be a better conductor? Well, yes, if it had a lower resistance, then yes, it would be more beneficial. But to rattle that off the top of my head, I wouldn't like to commit, although I'm pretty confident we use copper for a reason. Actually, I believe gold is a better conductor, but then that would be very, very expensive and a lot of very unhappy people who like gold in the planet when it's all used in your wires. But Theoretically, there's no issue. There's no reason as to why it could not work. Well, Kalim, I think that's a good explanation for why you should buy gold. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, okay. Well, uh, the uh, second question, uh, again from Bart, uh, can't we measure current using the voltmeter too, or the galvanometer, in fact? Okay, a voltmeter, no. Okay, a voltmeter is designed to have an incredibly high resistance because the idea of any measuring device is never to affect the circuit. Now, there's something called a multimeter path which can switch between an ammeter and a voltmeter and an ohmmeter if you want, but the circuitry is like switching a channel. It's like changing the internal what circuit you're connecting to. So a voltmeter on its own used as an ammeter, not a chance in hell. And a galvanometer would not be suitable for uh, normal uh, circuits in the class. Whilst they can measure current, galvanometers are used to measure incredibly small currents. So whilst it is a very sensitive ammeter, the word very sensitive is a giveaway, it's only useful for measuring. Ve you're very likely to come off the scale path unless I was using a high-resistance circuit. 
And the last question for Parth again, uh, isn't EMF equal to lost voltage plus the potential difference with the terminal? Isn't it just that? This lecture is based and aimed at GCSE and IGCSE and not A level. And therefore it's been pitched at a level that is suitable for the students. I have to say, Parth, the, your previous two questions, well, the, the liquid mercury one's well beyond A level as well. Uh, never mind IGCSE and GCSE. And the voltmeter one, well, it's a good question. Again, would not be relevant to both of these um, syllabuses, but it's a good question because it shows you that you're thinking. And I would never um, discourage a student from thinking outside the box, but understand it. Look, look at the, the title of the slide. It's been pitched at a specific level. All right. Uh, we could go further beyond that and we could start talking even more complex mathematics, but we're, we're, this this lesson isn't aimed at that level. So it's pitched appropriately. So yes, IGCSE students, GCSE, there's no lost volts for you. A level. We'll deal with it later. Well, uh, thank you, Kaleem, for fielding out the questions. And I think on that note, uh, you know, we can wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be solving problems on the same topics on Thursday. And uh, as usual, for updates, follow our Instagram page, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to discuss with students, uh, you know, you can just join the uh, Zenodes uh, Discord community. Uh, so I guess uh, see you all on uh, Thursday then. Bye-bye.